Um, so, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I am here with Stephen Wolfe, who's a former member for of the European Parliament and the director of the Centre for Migration in Europe, did you just say? I've completely <laughs> blanked on what you just told me, like literally <laughs> five seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm now the director for the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, looking at how we control managed migration across not only the UK, Europe, but across the US as well. Okay. So. Well, I'm sure we were going we're going to get into that as you mentioned <laughs> that you would like to talk about it. So yeah, it's a, it's a super interesting topic. And I did a lot of of um, research into like immigration and attitudes to immigration and sort of causes and consequences of it as part of like I wrote a whole book on Brexit. So um, I'm sure we'll have some interesting chat about that. Brilliant. But um, to start with, um, I wanted to 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 start with Boris um, and. Yeah, getting booed at the Platinum Jubilee, which was just, I think, the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. Like that's a home, that's home turf, man. That's the friendliest crowd you're gonna get outside of like CCHQ. And he got booed. <laughs> well, it, it, it's I think it's an inevitability, and actually, in some ways, I'm I'm pleased for him because now he can join the long list of. Uh, Conservative and Labour uh, prime ministers that have been booed. I certainly was there booing Tony Blair whenever I got the opportunity to see him because uh, I think he just destroyed this country and set it on the tra channels that we are. But it is highly embarrassing for him. I, I think what's even more embarrassing for him is the fact that it's come days before his own MPs have decided that they've got enough um, kind of letters have gone into uh, Sir Brady uh, and asked the them to face this no confidence vote this evening. And he's under a huge amount of pressure. And he's brought this upon himself, quite frankly. He brought this upon himself by removing the Brexiteers from his inner circle. Not only those like Dominic Cummings and the head of the communications, but actually starting to remove the Brexiteer MPs from having influence uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and as a consequence of that, you can see that all the policies that he's gone by the wayside. And will he survive tonight? Maybe, maybe. I suspect he probably will, but severely weakened and they'll, they'll be looking for another opportunity. Like my question is like, always, it's like who who comes next? Like that, <laughs> that, that <laughs> cabinet is not stuffed with potential leadership <laughs> candidates. You know, it's not... <laughs> They're not brimming over with with talented, you know, articulate, well liked people. Like, what do, what do they do if they get rid of him? Well, I, I think if they get rid of him, this is about the kind of usual. I would use the word perennial, but it's not quite as 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 often as that. But there is fratricide that goes within the Conservative Party, matricide, if you realise when they did it with Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. <laughs> but this is this is part and parcel of being a Conservative MP, every single one of them believes that they can be the greatest Prime Minister since, since sliced bread. And, you know, th this is what they are. But I was out in Westminster last week. I was um, doing a number of meetings and interviews uh, with people within various government bodies. And I, I talked off the record with some people who were working in the Cabinet Office, and I won't reveal names or how I, I got to them in case, but one of the things that they they said, and these are lifelong conservatives, lifelong Conservative Party members within the the kind of groups that run the country, and and they said that there is very few, if any, Conservative MPs that have the talent to understand the briefs of their own uh, of, of their own ministries. So looking after the Conservative government and being the Prime Minister, there isn't that enormous amount of talent out there to do so. But the question is. What is the talent? That's the question Joshua should be asking. Is it the question to be able to understand the brief, the legal niceties of the law that's been sent there, the financial ramifications of the economics of your decisions? Or is it the ability to be able to manage your own party by saying, OK, I can shift Mr. A and Miss B into these particular good positions so that I keep them quiet? I can look at these individuals going on the lists for the Conservative Party in new in new seats, say the by-elections, and I know I've got a supporter. This is the purpose person I'm going to elevate with an honour or a gong, and that'll keep them quiet whilst I just get on with the job of accepting whatever I've been told to do, either by the civil service or by those 
who wish to benefit from the, the financial might of the British economy. Mm. And I think that's really where we are, because all prime ministers are now are seemingly less capable of directing true economic power to the benefit of the people of this country, because such is the influence externally from either the United States or those who are forever Remainers trying to bring us into the orbit of the European Union. We don't have that enormous massive companies that are able to compete internationally that can sway a government too much. There are still some. But at the end of the day, it's about keeping your own army under control and managing to defeat the army of the left. Mm. So what do you think is the skill that we should be looking for in it? Like, well, I, I want to talk more about that influence of America, but like, what do you think is the ideal sort of skill set for, for a prime minister? Like, is it, is it like a legislator? Or is it as, as like a party manager in, in a way that you, you sort of described? I think it's someone who's got to be an intellectual bruiser, uh, somebody who has the capability of being a Henry VIII, one who is <laughs> quite happily, absolutely 100% uh, pro-patriotic English. And he doesn't care how much he is going to cause damage to other countries in order to protect the interests of the United Kingdom. Almost every uh, president of the United States has that capability. They might not have it internally, intellectually, or they might not have it physically. But what they do have is they have the army of the military behind them and huge backers are saying, we're going to use our military might to control country X or Y or remove that, that government or get rid of that leader, all because we want to ensure the status of our companies or our influence globally. So someone who's got to be a bruiser is capable of doing that. But they've also got to be um, incredibly devious, I would say, uh, in the sense that you look at the way that Cromwell was, incredibly smart and devious, because there is within the UK establishment some seriously skillful, devious people. Everybody understands how senior civil servants are able to avoid responsibility and yet keep everything along the lines, how they've managed to build the influence of either uh, the UN or the European Union through our institutions. So to be able to take over them, you've got to be skillful in that set. And then I, I would like to see a third element that all prime ministers should have, which is a true empathy and understanding of the mass of the British people who were born here, not just those who are able to attend the Queen's Garden parties or the events in number 10 or the, the events for huge donors, but actually being able to understand what the plumber in, in Bristol is trying to understand, what the cleaner in Norfolk is trying to understand, what the small pub owner in Clandidnod Wells tries to deal with on a daily basis. Those millions of people who have to go to work and struggle about, about electricity and gas and travel, how they're looking at the schools for their children. Someone who can really grasp that and understand that. And there have been very few that have really managed to encapsulate those three qualities that I see as a prime minister. Uh is there anyone vaguely <laughs> approaching that description? Because I, I mean, I'm not sure I agree with like everything you said there. But I mean, if that person was in charge, like, okay, I can't see them doing a worse job. But like, is there anyone that approaches that? Because and like this is this is like kind of brings me to something I wanted to ask you about. And and I've been I've been thinking about it a lot like recently in the last like I don't know more and more and more in the last like four, three four months. It's just that like. I'm watching the things that go on on TV. Like when you when you watch the people like Michael Gove or any any MPs or members of the cabinet who are trotted out on like Newsnight or or on yeah on the national news to like defend the 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 seemingly indefensible with like the the, the obscene amount of parties and drinking that clearly went on inside Number Ten during during lockdowns, and I just. I look at it like a theater. It's just a pantomime. Like this, like well, all these discussions that are going on on TV is just like it's nothing. Like there's no no relation between this thing that we're watching as politics and like what's actually happening in like running the country. And there's no connection to it whatsoever. And I just wonder, it's like are all of them just like like empty vessels of like uh, just to be used by yeah 
the cabinet or the, the, the leaders of the party or like the people who are pulling the strings here to, to just have a show while they go off and like run the country in the way they want? Like, are we just looking at like a pantomime? I, I think there is that, that's what they turn into. I mean, my experience of being a member of the European Parliament may only have been for like five years, but obviously I was kind of campaigning and a member of the Conservative Party. I was elected uh, as a councillor prior to that, and I'd have been involved in politics way before 2010 and the Brexit campaign. And what I saw even in European politics is actually in some, some ways a microcosm of what happens in national politics. You get a lot of people, not all, who are very interested in trying to achieve something. So let's say our, our party that I was started off with, which was UKIP, was very interested in getting rid of um, the, our membership of the European Union. And they're all gung-ho, and we're all like excited, and there we were campaigning, and then they're elected. And then suddenly transforms. What I saw almost immediately was the fundamental view from all those 24 that was there, that all of them could have been as good as Nigel Farage. All of them were the best TV presenters for the case. That, and they all wanted to have it be on the TV. And then there were others who were a little bit more uh, uh, kind of nuanced. They started to think, well, hang on a minute. There's a huge amount of money here or there's influence I could get with businesses. And they started to say, well, I'll never be like Nigel Farage. And maybe I'm not good enough to get on TV. So let's do it something for personal interest. And there are those who genuinely thought they could achieve things too. And I suspect that what you get is quite a lot of MPs are like that when they first enter, of all political parties. But as they get into the to the to the system, their own political parties, they realize that to climb the ladder to have any influence, you've got to sell yourself out in some ways, particularly with those big parties. You've got to vote for things you don't believe in. And then you suddenly realize that it's actually internally getting to you as a person. It starts saying, well, I'm not as good as I am. I'm not even, uh, as big as I am. That person is climbing the ladder faster than me. So if I need to climb the ladder, I've got to cling on to that person. So that personal interest. So after a while, it just becomes like the Oxford Union, the Cambridge Union. It becomes like student politics. And, and they've been used to that because almost, almost all MPs now are products of universities, not products of, of the, the University of Life. And as a consequence of that, that's what their, their focus and their mentality is. And they're mixing with people who they know and understand that. So it becomes a bit more of a game to them. Uh, and I think the disappointment of not being able to influence or do things, even in smaller ways, starts to eat away at them. So they then start going, right, let's do the personal interests. So how do I become a director of a business? How do I ensure that once I leave politics, I can get... 300 odd pounds a day by me becoming a member of the House of Lords. Hmm. How do I get on to a large charity? I mean, I'd love to be Miliband sitting there with like 1 million a year sitting on the charities that he sits on or the David, what was it, Osborne with seven jobs. Yeah. That's where they start thinking about it and they go, all right, I've got to do something. And I, I, I think that's where they, they start losing interest and they don't look at what they've done. And I, many of them just sadly also don't have the intellectual capability to be legislators or understand their briefs. Oh, well, that's slightly depressing. Um, <laughs> Come on. Oh, I mean, like, to be honest, I wasn't. <laughs> Let's not have the audience like, like stringing themselves up and going, this woe is me. But, but the point that I want to make out there is that whenever I've been with both political parties, um, I generally say the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, I, I don't think I've really met anyone in the Liberal Democrats that I've ever thought was capable of doing the job or actually was um, really didn't have a really extreme agenda. Uh, certainly in the Scottish National Party, I, I think they've got some very talented people, a very understanding of their brief, and they, they use it very well. Not all of them. Um, but within both Labour Party and Conservative parties, there have been the ones that I've met and the ones that I know who are really understanding. They're very patriotic in their own way in the Conservatives. They believe in the message if they're a left winger in the Labour Party. And they genuinely can get things done. But that level of individual is, is small. But is that, un, is, is that unusual? Think about a corporation or a business. How many people really could run a big company? How can run a small company? Some of those who are just the followers and some of those who got the talent to do it. But we, we expect our political parties to scan the country and pull out those who are articulate, yeah. who are bright enough to understand a brief, to be sensible and responsible. 
and not just to be all about themselves and how do they play the game of just getting elected and sitting back. Mm. And, and, and that's where the failure is of the institutions of those political parties. I think they, they're, they're, their selection process and their hunting down for the new candidates is the failure. And we, the people, are the ones who are being failed by it. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of concerning. I read a great book about this, actually, by um, Isabel Hardman called Why We Get the Wrong Politicians. Yes. And then actually another a book called uh, Corruptible um, by Brian Class, just like similar. So it's like, do, do we elect these awful, corruptible, you know, moralist people or, you know, does the does the power and the, the position sort of create that but illusion? I, but I also think that, unfortunately, the way that politics is done, and I, again, I speak from the experience, the way that you get hammered by the press over a particular issue, ir irrespective of my familial background or my upbringing, uh, the constant refrain that I was a racist or a homophobe or whatever for the political politics is deliberately done to scare ordinary citizens out from from getting involved. You think and that's that, like what makes you say that's deliberate, like that that's the goal of it? I, I think what they do is it, it's it's really important for political parties not to have independence come to the fore because there is a need for political parties. There's no really need for a political party. I mean, we don't have a constitution that says you can be an MP only if you're in a, a political party. The political parties have been formed really as electioneering vehicles to be able to select candidates of a similar view, they say. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a vehicles of money, weaponry, and the media are very much at, at, at ease with that because they go to the same universities with these people anyway. How many times do you look at an interviewer and say, well, you're in the same college as the one you're interviewing? You know, that, that's, that just happens. And so they're comfortable with it. What they're not comfortable is a bunch of people that they've never really known about, didn't go to university with perhaps, didn't go to the same schools with them, and going, hang on, they're not part of this institution I know very well. And I would love to see a, a kind of independence movement across this country backed by those who might be able just to willingly provide funding for seats across the country with just a general view that maybe we might be just patriotic, supporting the flag, supporting faith, with a general view that you do your best for your constituents. And that danger of not being part of a political party where, as I said, you can be pushed around, offered jobs, moved here, given the, the inklings of cash benefits or promotion that's the benefit of a, a party. You can keep control of your MPs. But a whole bunch of independents? My God, that, sh that would scare the living daylights out of the elites because they'd have to try and find methods of controlling 600-odd people. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it would be really, really interesting to see that happen. I mean, like, I keep wondering because, I mean, one of the lessons I, I remember from, from my, like, GCSE A-level politics was this idea that every time you get like a crisis or like a, a big event or something, something major happens that sort of like shifts the way the, the sort of paradigm of politics or the world works. And you tend to get a new political party um, and that's sort of born out of the, the, the ashes of whatever madness has just happened. And uh, like, for example, when, when sort of UKIP sprung up, like you, you were starting to get this real sort of resentment of the EU. There was like the, but it all sprung up in the in the wake of the 2008 crash really is where i see like the 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 reason that ukip became the political force that they did and i'm kind of wondering it's like what where is the new party that's meant to like counter the madness cuz like the two current parties have just and i've spoken about this with a number of people they've completely abandoned their their like apparent values and the base and the people the voters that they're meant to represent i mean the labor party is not interested in in representing like trade unions and and like working class people apparently no. anymore like no. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any semblance of that left like Jerry, when when jerry corbyn left like that was it for that as far as i was concerned right <laughs> yes. and the tories like the the fiscally conservative tories right have, have blown up the biggest fucking budget deficit that has <laughs> ever existed in the history like aside from like wartime and and i don't even know what it is what percentage it is of of gdp but it's it's it was like approaching. Is it 110, it was, yeah, 120 it was, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was like yeah. I think the last time I checked, it was like 112, something like that. Yeah, that is fucking obscene. And can yeah. you imagine like 
the, these are the fiscal conservatives, the small <laughs> government people putting in place like the most draconian regulations that you could possibly imagine over like over the past two years. Like I would have fucking bet my life that those Tories <laughs> wouldn't do that. Like Jacob Rees Mogg, fucking freedom, like and liberty would be fine with all this, right? Like what the fuck? <laughs> what, what happens when two parties like abandon everything they're meant to stand for? And like, where is the like the 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 sort of where do all these voters go? Like, what do you think's going to happen? Well, there's nowhere for them to go. There is nowhere for them to go at the moment. I mean, I could not imagine a world without the the, the UKIP position being here today in this scenario, not being able to hold the Conservatives at base over their issues of. of small c conservative fiscal responsibility, freedom and liberty, because they'd be petrified of losing seats. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the Labour Party wouldn't be so gung-ho of not being able to define what a woman is or being able to suggest that it's 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 perfectly okay to allow 1.61 million people to enter the country with visas in one year. That So we have a million new immigrants in one year in areas which surely suppress the old voters that they had. But it's because they know that there is no, no alternative. There's no independent movement alternative. And then you have uh, Lawrence Fox's party and Richard Tice's party, which really should be massively galvanating uh, the, the resistance but to Lawrence, this fundamental Lawrence change. Lawrence Fox is just unlikable, completely unlikable. And, and it, it, it's just not happening uh, because Lawrence is concentrating just on wokedom. And to be honest, Yes, it's important when I go to my job in the civil service to, you know, in, in, say, Manchester or in a hospital. And I'm really frustrated beyond anything when I'm being told I've got to go to a lesson on diversity, you know, which is not about you've got to love Black Lives Matter. Maybe you've got to kneel in terms of your classroom. Of course, that's frustrating. But at the end of the day, I've got to go home and worry about a 100 percent increase in my gas bill. Mm. You know, I've got to look at, and I do this personally. My electricity bill as a single single father in this cottage has gone up from two hundred and thirty pounds a year, which is relatively manageable, to seven hundred. You know, my shit. my gas bill has gone from six hundred because I'm on external gas from six hundred to one thousand one hundred. My mum on her old council house in Manchester is seeing figures of three times that, and then on a loan. So Lawrence Fox is not understanding mm. that people do see this freedom issue as important. But get to grips with the, the cost of existence crisis. This isn't cost of living. It's a cost of existence. And then you have Richard Tice, who, yes, I admit, has touched upon immigration because Nigel Farage is still at the background of it. But it's only seen as a two-person party, him and Dr. Ball. Mm. And he hasn't got the ability to branch out and bring out all the other individuals that at least Farage could do. And we're not seeing him going across the country. And my mother actually loves him. I th she thinks he's great. But I've got other members of my North Northern family think he's just another Southern leader that doesn't understand them or the Midlands or the coast because they're not out there doing these meetings with them. So they have no one. And that, Josh, is shown in the polls. Just take a look at how many people were voting in the local elections. Yeah. Is it just over 22, 23%? Mm. Lowest ever since the, you know, the Second World War. People would, died and fought for the freedoms to be able to have the vote over hundreds of centuries. And the people of this country are now looking at the elites in parliament and saying, you don't do anything for us. We don't trust you. And now we don't even bother want to vote. Now, who really wins from that? Who wins? The winners are the global elites who now are silencing the voice that can change anything that they want to do. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really concerning because then people because people lose like a a stake in politics because the, there's there's people who just feel abandoned by the parties that they may have voted for their whole lives. There's people like me who maybe never felt particularly affiliated to a party, um, maybe liked a couple of politicians, but like and now it's just like there's no there's no humans left. In, <laughs> that's 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 actually that's it. There's no humans left in Parliament. Like. They, <laughs> Well, if you've seen the if you've seen the Abba Avatar concert, uh, it wouldn't be long before we might actually get our a a i m p sitting in Parliament. For us. I don't I don't get why the holograms are good. Just, do you know what? I'm not interested in watching a hologram. Like I'd I'd actually rather see the old versions of them 
like, yes. on stage just performing and be like, well, you know, they've aged, but it's still them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hologram politics. Yeah. That's where we might be moving to with AI voting, to be honest. <laughs> hologram Churchill versus Hologram Attlee. <laughs> yes. In round one, we've got in the corner. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's where it's going to go, man. But um, I want to go back to a figure you mentioned there because it kind of draws us onto the, the you wanted to talk about about um, migration and immigration to Britain. And you yeah. mentioned like 1.61 million um, like when... visas issued last year alone. So okay, so you, like these, yeah, these do you want to talk the, me through that and then yeah, I'll, so I'll this, have a look. This is the most enormous numbers that we're getting in the history uh, of of our uh, our politics in terms of immigration into the country. Everyone was absolutely clear that there was deep uh, concern across the country of large-scale immigration, both from the EU and the non-EU countries prior to the Brexit campaign. One of the main fundamental arises of why people voted, particularly across the Midlands and North and some of the smaller towns and cities across the South and the Southwest, was to control immigration. The, co- the government said, we will control it if we get Brexit. Yes, we stopped EU citizens from having freedom of movement, but we have not stopped the changes in the rules and the laws that are allowing huge numbers of people coming over to work. It was supposed to be about the sense that we get highly skilled workers coming to the UK. Highly skilled now is someone who is regarded as a brickie or a plumber, someone who is kitchen staff in the back of a of a kitchen. You know, these are regarded as highly skilled individuals. Now, they are skilled. I know because my own family, you know, from a building background, no one would say that my uncle John or my uncle Albert weren't skilled in what they did and be able to build and keep houses up or be able to put the plumbing around the house as my uh, sister's partner is. But that's not what the public determined were highly skilled. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're getting these numbers. You've had a COVID period in which the reductions were there. So... How is it in the first year towards the middle of the end of COVID that we've allowed an enormous amount of people into this country? And and if you just look at some of the figures, we have 371,000 family reunions. That means that someone's come here. We've also had 371,000 members of their family allowed to come as well. We had last year 28,500 channel migrants alone crossing the channel. But there was over 10,500 who came over in lorries and vans as well. We're all claiming benefits. We're all getting uh, accommodation, whether it's in a hotel, but they get the long-term accommodation. We've got students being able to come over. And we had, which is, I really find it shocking, over a 500% increase in Nigerian students being granted visas to come in one year. Is that down to the fact that the government has now said that if you're a student in the UK, after two years, you can stay after your course for two years without getting a visa and you can work. I expect that number to absolutely balloon because that's an excuse. I can come over and do a sports course on David Beckham's underwear and get a degree from whichever university is desperate enough to be able to fund me or college. But knowing after two years finishing that, I can stay in the UK and get any job I want and never be kicked out. This is not about controlling immigration. It's about opening the doors in a bigger and wider way, but being sneaky about it. Okay. So the, I've got a couple of questions. First off, where, where can I find this 1.61 million figure? Cause I I've got the, the UK, um, UK government website up and it says in the year ending September, 2021, um, there was an estimated 21 million passenger arrivals. There was one point, right. uh, 1.115 million visas granted, um, which is 19% fewer than the previous year and 64% pr- fewer than the year before. Okay. So what, what happens is um, every, every day the Home Office s- sends out a briefing letter detailing a whole panoply of things, so briefing notes, commentary, statistics, transparency reports. We even get up to £500 of what's been spent in the Home Office, for example, news stories. And what my centre, the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, is doing is we're collating that on a daily basis and publishing it on a weekly basis. So that goes onto our website. In addition, you get the Office of National Statistics. So this, they're, they're currently undergoing what they call changes to 
the migration statistics mm. and also population statistics. So on the 26th of May, and just uh, 26th of May, which I think was a Thursday, they published these figures with the, a, a summary and an update. Now that's on my website. There's links to it that'll go to that. So I, um, I think I've just about published that today with my summary and commentary. So that'll be on later. But what you will also see on those figures is that the Home Office have published literally about 40 immigration documents all during the course of this Jubilee weekend. <laughs> Mass statistics of numbers. And I looked at it and I just thought, this is vast. And they've changed some of the language. They've changed some of the categories. So I was looking at this. I've been building modeling on numbers based on the old system. They've changed it. I will now have to spend months changing the system to try and match theirs again. And it's a very cleverly done. So that's where you'll get it, the ONS and the Home Office. And for, um, then you'll also get it onto my website in, in, in an accumulated way. Yeah, just because I, I think be also link this for people. Uh, yeah, no, I'll, I, I can send you the link. And I think also, um, I think Brexit for Britain.org also did a good summary of that too. Um, I, I think they're called Brexit for Britain. I, I was glancing through the webs looking for who's reporting on this. Mm. And other than GB News, who had me on and uh, Talk, Talk TV, very few other news agencies reporting on this. And, and I've had meetings with people about immigration with those in Westminster. And they're very concerned about, as we said, what they call the cost of living crisis. But I'll give you three examples. This morning, I ha had a notice of a lady who came from Poland, has been working here as a cleaner for 11 years. She's just been handed uh, a flat in this new build complex in Winchester, which would cost half a million pounds for you and I to buy. And that's now social housing. She's had it of 11 years being in here. A 19-year-old was given a flat in the same part of the same complex. And also someone who came from Iraq only six years ago, but had a child, has been given a flat in there as well. Now, this is where the frustration comes for people living on the council estates around Winchester, who know that they will never be able to afford those. And they're not going to be on that category. You don't often see men being given flats in these houses. So that's an accommodation issue. That's fundamentally impacting. If it's impacting here, it's impacting all over the country. One of the things I picked up over Actually, on... Can we, can we just pause there? Because I want to I talk about that. So, like, yeah. so, so the contention is that the, the yeah, people, so the, the Polish lady and the, the Iraqi woman, did you say, woman? Yes. Um, have been given, yeah, these flats. Um, under under what scheme do they get given this? And is it open to everyone? Do you apply to it? Oh, yeah. I mean, let's not get this wrong. This, the, the, these schemes for if you want social accommodation in any part of the country all f fall within the, the remit of the local authority who will ask people to make an application to stay in, in, in social housing when it becomes available. Mm -hmm. But as we know, social housing isn't that available that often. So we have rather big lists. And councils make a selection process. They make a selection process based on everyone who's making that application. So obviously, someone who is a, a woman with children will be higher on the list. Someone who might be ill, which is what I understand the Polish lady has, uh, she, she's ill, gets higher on the list and given this accommodation. I think the fundamental question that people are asking is that when you look at the economics of immigration into the country, they always... The always big immigration point is that it improves GDP. Mm -hmm. It really improves the economy for people. Yeah. But the alternative right. argument is that no one is ever available to pay enough taxes to get the benefits of living in this country compared to those who've been born in this country and the families that have built them up. There's no way that someone who's been here 11 years will pay enough tax as a cleaner to be able to afford that house or pay accommodation for social accommodation to be bought by the council. So why is that being given to them rather than somebody who was born here or family was here? So that would be the big clash why people are getting really upset by this. I just look at it in terms of numbers. I'm going to leave it out to other politicians and policymakers to decide whether it's right or wrong. <clears throat> so when I look at uh, immigration coming in from channel migrants, when I assess their journey, the moment they're picked up by Border Force or the Oral and I, 
Then they're brought into the Kent intake unit and assessed, and doctors are brought in to assess them. Then they're given access to lawyers and legal aid. Mm. Then in comes Clear Homes or Serco or Mears Homes and transports them either to a, a hotel or to a short-term accommodation mm -hmm. where they're left and they're paid income and then they get free healthcare, free dentistry, all the stuff that my mother wouldn't get as a pensioner. The free dentistry she doesn't get, but these people do. Legal aid, if you're a man or a woman seeking help in a divorce or access to your children, you won't get legal aid, but they will. So when you add up these costs in the first year, it's around £40,000 per individual asylum applicant. If you add on the numbers that are expected to come this year, 80,000, you're looking around, uh, the figures are going to be around four to eight billion, depending on which numbers come in and which one's accurate, if it's 60,000 or 80,000. But you're looking at 40,000 per individual. If you, is the top end eight billion in one year? Eight billion is a huge amount of money that could go to giving housing, for example, to those single parent families nearly a quarter of a million of them across the country living in bed and brex breakfast with their children. Why aren't we building the homes to, to take them out of those horrible situations? And that goes back to your initial point, Josh, about it, is why aren't the politicians saying there is a, a family living in one or two rooms in a bed and breakfast, and I am not complaining about as much about a channel migrant coming over so I can make the savings to build a house so that they can go in. Mm. Those are the big fundamental decisions. And that's why the mass immigration into this country is important. It's about the cost it has and where you put those resources into looking after the people who are already struggling in this country. Okay. So your contention would basically be that the money that we would spend on um, dealing with asylum seekers and things like that would be better spent looking after you know the people who are already in the country, essentially. Yes, and I, I think you've got to look at the way that every family will look at the money coming in on a monthly basis. They will turn around and they will, look, first of all, are having to pay their mortgage or their rent and then their gas and electricity, and then they will look at how they get food. And if there's anything left over, they might be putting it aside to go on a holiday or a trip or go to see their families across the country when it's now so expensive to do so. Uh, the little treats that you might have. And everybody makes those fundamental decisions. Mm. And if they can, they know that their brother or their sister, the cousin, needs a little bit of a helping hand. Everybody knows someone who's sick or ill. you know. And then they, they start saying, well, hang on, I can't get to the front of the queue for my dentist or my doctor or the hospital. And why isn't that? Why, why is that the case? Why isn't the money being spent on it? And then they'll look around the government and go, well, hang on a minute, you're spending $8 billion on asylum applications. You're, you've allowed how many billions to be wasted for companies on fraud mm. during COVID, and you're not pursuing any of them. Yeah. You're not locking any of them up. You're actually why cutting is that? thousands of staff from HMRC in whilst doing it yeah yeah why are you doing that and these are legitimate questions whereas i just focus on immigration there are others who are focusing on why are you wasting that sort of money why are you not doing it why are you you sacking people in one area which could be used to pursue these people so i'm only just one aspect about why i think that we need to manage migration do i really believe that we need to have 371,000 family reunions in this country which increases the demand for housing I don't know every individual case, but policymakers should be made aware of the impacts on housing, schools, hospitals, and the pressures that ordinary people who might be watching your show are saying, well, hang on, that's exactly what I'm feeling. That's what I see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand like where a lot of that 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 anger and, and stuff comes from. Like the one I'm gonna say two things on this actually. So like mm. first off. Like, aren't we legally obligated as a member of the United Nations to to like take the asylum seekers if they arrive on our shores? Like, isn't that a part of our? The, yes, yeah, isn't I mean, the, like it's it's like a it's not something that we can opt out of basically whilst remaining within the 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 legal system that governs yeah the world post World War Two that we like helped author. Um, so I'm always like, you know, we probably have to. But like the main thing is like, do you see these two things as mut being mutually exclusive? 
because like to me the, all the things you've pointed out about um the waste of money um that the government yet yeah, has has done over yeah the the the, the trillions that they printed <laughs> through covid to to, yeah. for to pay for the lockdowns to keep everyone at home to to pay Pfizer and Moderna obscene amounts of money for their very safe and effective vaccine um, <laughs> yeah, yeah let's not go there uh, but no 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 I'm just looking at my third shoulder yeah the amount the, <laughs> but the amount of money that like they have given out and the amount of money spent doesn't feel to me like those two issues are, are mutually exclusive like it seems to me like like the government are pretending to make a choice here that doesn't need to be made. Like the, the does like to me, we can have like a, a more humane asylum policy. Which like I spoke to a professor all about about like literally like exclusively about the uh, the asylum process. And you see, if we like didn't make it take like eight years to get to process people, we'd probably save ourselves a shit ton of money. Um, but so I'd, I'd say that a lot, a lot, I'd say that the costs could probably be like tempered if we reformed our asylum process, like from my understanding of it, but like mainly, do you think they're mutually exclusive? Like why can't we have like an, uh, yeah, a way in which asylum seekers can come here, be processed, um, humanely quickly so that they can move on with their lives. Cause no one wants to sit in, in that limbo detention period, but mainly like, can we not spend the money on investing in our communities, like building more social housing, better transport, like all of these things? Like, why to you are they like not both okay. possible simultaneously? Okay, I think there's fundamentally three points that I, I need to address. First of all, is the UN Convention on Refugees uh, and its addendums do give us a legal responsibility uh, to actually uh, look after those who are deemed to become an asylum. Uh, asylum applicant when they arrive in the country. And that does mean that we must provide accommodation for them, we must provide health for them, legal issues, and uh, and benefits as well. And and they have to have it. And it's up to a country to determine how they get that. Uh, and, and my point is that they do get all of that when they arrive here automatically. And uh, the, the next point is, you have to ask yourself, are they all genuine asylum applicants coming over. Now, this is the big point. I, I think if you're looking at those who are coming from the Ukraine, most people will say, hang on, your house has just been bl blown up. And, you know, whether you believe it or not, whether we're the ones who are helping support NATO to expand that caused Russia to go, or you think Russia just did it because it was Tuesday and they felt like it, then that's consequential on the fact that these people are coming over. And there's a genuine thing that we see. Mm. And when you look into places like Iraq in Iran and Afghanistan, which are the three major com countries at the moment, although we're seeing increasing numbers coming from Africa, uh, you'll ask yourself the same question. Are they genuine asylum applicants or are they fleeing for economic reasons? Now, the UN Convention does not allow somebody to just shop around the countries to go to for economic reasons. The World Bank has published a report saying that there are millions of people, 300 and odd million people now, who are moving around the globe. And of those who are deemed in the asylum process, 60% of them are economic migrants, fleeing because genuinely they see things now on televisions that life is better in a different country. You know, if, if you're looking at someone who's living in a shack in Afghanistan and they can see that their cousin has just been given a £400,000 house flat in Winchester, you're going to come. Hmm. And that's that's the question. So the, the fundamental point for you, first of all, is to address in any asylum process, are we doing so? And I know the arguments. I know the arguments. People are saying, look, after both the first case and the appeal system, 80% of people who make applicants for, for asylum are granted it. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that's fundamentally uh, true in terms of the numbers, but it doesn't replicate the fact that many of these now are coming in on the very uh, uh, similar arguments all the time. It's like they're all being very coached, exactly what to say. And secondly, even when they lose their appeal, we don't remove them. So we have huge numbers of people here that have been built up over uh, the last decade who fail their applicant process and are never removed. That also gives encouragement for those to come over. What, if your point what happens to those people, are they just sort of in limbo, like unable to work legally, or 
Uh, no, they, they, they get, um, they're allowed to go into the market and choose a, a house and rent a house. And if they get a, rent, a rental house, that's paid out of council tax, free. Well, even if they get the application rejected? Even if they get the rejected, because we have adopted a moral responsibility to pay them and they get benefits as well. So they stay here. So the chap that um, in Liverpool that blew up the car outside the hospital and was on the way to try and murder people at they say, at Liverpool uh, Cathedral was one of those failed asylum applicants who was living in accommodation provided for by the by the state via our council tax and uh, and the benefits process. So that's one of the things that I say. The second thing, uh, the third point is about you're saying the asylum process. I agree the asylum process should be improved. Uh, I'm, I've, I've always argued that. Uh, I do think that the process is right, that we should be doing so outside of the country at the moment because we just don't have enough accommodation here to be able to house them. And it's cheaper to house someone in a different country than it is here. Uh, but the main important point is volumes of, of, of people. If you are a small country like the United Kingdom, which is now the biggest and the largest and most dense nation in Europe, we've overtook Holland now, for example, in England, then you're going to ask yourself, where can we house people? And some real important facts. How many people do you know are struggling to be able to buy a house because they can't afford it? And yet we're, we're building 165,000 houses a year. Huge numbers. 1.65 million houses. Just look that up. You'll see it very yeah, clearly. I want to. <laughs> yeah. 1.65 million houses. 165,000 a year. So over 10 years. And everywhere you turn, you can see a new housing estate, a new block of flats. And yet we can't afford them. And yet there are people still living in hovels and bed and breakfasts. So if we're building so many houses, why is it that the prices aren't reducing? And it's because of overpopulation. And the biggest aspect of population growth in the United Kingdom over the past 20 years has been immigration from other countries. I'll give you an example of there. When we talked about the European Union, uh, we had a scheme. We created a scheme that says that those members of, who've been living here who were part of European Union citizens could reside and remain here. And I think that was only right and fair, because after all, it was our decision to leave Brexit, but those people have been working here. They said it was just around four, four million people. But we know the European scheme that the government has implemented has given over 5.2 million visas. So we've had 5 million Europeans come here. We now got large numbers of non-EU citizens residing here. Where do they live? And when they find somewhere to live, they've got to apply for a doctor. Why is it the doctor's surgeries? We're not producing that many new doctors, are we, mm. to sustain the levels? We know the crisis in the NHS. What about schools? When you look at these new huge housing complex, do you see brand new primary schools being built? Are there huge new secondary schools or um, the other types of schools that are being allowed to be built across the country being built? No. What about the roads? Almost everywhere you go now in England, you've got mass road traffic problems. Why? Because we've got huge numbers of lorries on the roads, bringing in more food and more products to feed a larger population on a smaller island where density levels are huge. So the question you ask yourself, Josh, is was we can hold our hand out and heart and say, yes, we've got to look after people. The question is how many? Do you take and what's the impact on the nation as a whole and are we actually getting better as a nation with a larger increasing population and i would argue that our country is becoming more fractured more disjointed more difficult to live in more unhappy for most people not just because of the cost of living but because we're feeling cramped we don't feel we've got enough space if we want to go on holiday, it costs an arm and a leg. Mm. If we need to travel out to the Lake District or Wales, it's ours to get there. Space is declining our own personal warmth, and we're seeing masses of people whenever we go to shops on streets. Mm. And that is not good for the human soul. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely a thing about like when, when it, whenever a population becomes like 
too concentrated in one area. I don't know, but I, I'm always skeptical of these like overpopulation arguments because like, I, I, do you remember that that film Inferno? Um, it was a book by Dan Brown, and the whole yes. yeah, the the Robert Langdon one, and it's like the whole premise is the guy, the, the red the, cover, the, I think it was as well, super villain. I think it was a red cover. The, yeah, the, the villains like a point is that there's too many people and we're a disease, and that we got we got to like yeah, depopulate the earth, and that's that's the the super the villains point in the story, mm. and like after the after I read it, I end up like going and looking it up and doing like a whole like uh, essay for it in in uni about like was there too many people and i kind of figured that like there's not too many people like it's it's it, the only issue is like a is that a, there's a certain concentrated portion of the population i.e in north northern europe and america basically that they're using like all the power and all the resources and if we just became more efficient in the way we use them it'd probably be fine however when it comes to like <laughs> when it comes to public services they're not quite as abundant, unfortunately. Exactly, so, and they're not efficient. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, there's no. There we go. But the 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 thing that so like the thing I'm I was looking up about your your I was trying to find the housing statistics, so I couldn't find the ones from the last couple of years. But I found um in the 2016-17 um there was 184 thousand new houses built, and yeah, like, I think yeah, ma and the government's goal is like 300 thousand um. A year, I think. What, that's correct. Point? That's so, that's but, right. But they want to aim for three hundred thousand. They're missing. Like they've they've built like basically zilch in since the Conservatives came to power in two thousand ten. As far as, as well, far I wouldn't as say one hundred eighty five thousand is is zilch. No, but like these are all all the, the one hundred eighty five thousand is the pri- is the the private sector, like the amount yes. of government ho- like the government funded like social oh, yes. housing that people are sort of screaming out for. Like so since since that you're like give everyone the ability to buy their council house which you know fucking stroke a genius like give people a stake in the economy etc but like once she did that like the amount of houses like they built some under new labor labor but as soon as the the this you know iteration of the conservative party came to power it's like they failed to build any houses at all at an affordable price for people and that, that's probably also the problem like why why people can't afford this because the like it's we're definitely like dealing with the problem of like under supply but i think that that's being fed by again like this is always my point it's like lack of investment from from government in these public services and the same thing happened after the the 2008 crash when the tories came to power like the the further from the center of london that you went right the the more money people lost like i think it was in blackpool they experienced um, a cut to public services of like seven hundred and eighty pounds per person, like, it, and that is just obscene. And again, it like kind of always brings me back to like maybe this is like my you know like left the left wing part of me saying like you know we got to look after people, but like yeah. I just refuse to believe that like we can like have some sort of humane immigration policy where you know obviously there's a number that's too many because like. 10 million people a year is not sustainable. Like no. people are always like open borders. And you're like, there's a number at which it's too many, man. Like, you know, everyone varies on what they think that number is, but there is a number at which like, it's literally unsustainable. <laughs> but like part, I just, I refuse to believe that like the, 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 the only, the only argument basically that I buy in this case is, is that like, we're taking too many people to deal with the, the, the assimilation integration and upgrading public services fast enough and that's where i'm always like why that's that like the the thing that i try to get down to is like what is the number like do do you have it like because immigration is really useful especially as you pointed out because we're not training the doctors we're not training the nurses um and you know plenty of other skilled professions in which we are very much benefiting from the immigration system and like skilled skilled migrants and yeah doctors and nurses in the NHS is like the the best example for me anyway like what w- what is too much in your mind and like w- w- like annually what should we be looking at like as, as a healthy immigration system well i i would say i wrote a paper um for leave means leave at the time of the Brexit campaign and, and the post-Brexit immigration policy, some of it which has been uh, adopted in terms of the language in the current uh, government's uh, laws and, and procedures in place, and certainly the ideas are welcome. But at the time, I said we should have no more than 50,000 a year for a 10-year period. 
and that for a five-year period we should have no uh, um, manual or low-skilled immigration at all to allow the country to balance itself out. The general view is that in terms of populations, I think the number is around 2.1 you know, kind of children per family is the kind of reproduction levels that you need to sustain the the population level in your country. And it's always a key thing for policymakers who seem to not want to see their populations decline uh, for GDP purposes. Mm -hmm. Not quite the same as GNP or other ideas, but the GDP matters to them enormously. And dropping in populations could impact that uh, negatively in the way that they're modeling. My view is that you take a look at the country and see what the density values are. And are you happy with the level of density in your country? And I would say we're not. I, I, I'm sick and tired, quite frankly, of driving down country lanes as I did through Southampton the other day and came through an area called Hedge End and a huge swathe. I mean, not, not just tiny, on sides of the motorways are just being massacred, land, trees, houses, areas for just becoming, I think, something like 4,000 new houses. On the edge of Winchester, they built another 4,000 houses, and a, which is like a mini town on the edge of it. Mm. I am actually tired of seeing the countryside being decimated to make large corporations and millions of pounds. So I would certainly turn around and say that we should be looking at levels where the population doesn't increase for periods of time. And I'd like to see a population decrease in the UK so that we can bring these numbers down. Now, if you talk to those who I argue regularly from what I deem the immigration industry, the the huge numbers of charities involved in it, the large um, you know, universities that have departments about this, they'll never give you, never give you a number which they think is an appropriate number of people coming into the country. They will always argue that the government is not doing enough and we should bring in more. But I, I then point out to them, hang on a minute, I think it's about 12,500 Syrians we've brought in. We've got about four or 5,000 Afghans. We Yesterday's numbers, or was it Friday, saying we had 165,000 visas for Ukrainians to come across. With Hong Kong, we've got the ability to take in over 2 million Hong Kong citizens into the country. This country does do huge numbers, and at an average 40 to 50,000 a year asylum applicants over the past 10 years. I think we're doing pretty well right. in bringing large numbers of people into the country. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, do you think that's too much or too many? They'll never say how many. But I will then always point out, if you do the open door policy, which country in Europe tried that? Germany. Yeah. And what happened? Two and a half million people in five years? Do you think a country like Britain, which is one of those key areas of the world, the United States, Canada, Germany, France, Belgium, Holland, to a lesser extent, Spain, and certainly Italy, and then, but Greece is a transit point, but now if you look at areas of Greece, do you think those big countries in the world, which are where most people want to go and live, because they're all watching Netflix and they're all watching Sky and they're all watching their TV shows saying how wonderful it is. Mm. You know, the cities are paved with gold, not literally, but you can get houses, jobs, mobile phones, laptops, iPads, great clothes. Mm. You, you see all of that. Do you think that if we opened the doors, we wouldn't have similar numbers? And again, where are we going to house them? How are we going to feed them? Will social unrest come because of it? And, and these are the key points that anyone who has a sensible, and I hope that people can have a sensible debate, which is why the, my centre, the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, talks about numbers and cash. I'm putting it in those cold terms so that people could understand it, and then you make your own moral and policy judgments on the back of that. My own personal view is that we should still take people in. Absolutely. That's the moral thing to do. But it's also a moral thing to do is to make sure that those living the, in this country are also well protected, which goes on to other areas where we should have politicians who do not waste money on ill-conceived ideas, that we should prevent the fraud that goes on, that we should have a more moralistic and sensible way of dealing with our health system rather than a spendthrift to large corporations like Pfizer getting huge amounts of money. And I think we're on alignment on that. And that's my left-wing side of the brain coming in saying, 
let's deal with the corporates mm. who are pillaging the public purse mm -hmm. at the real attack of ordinary citizens who are having to struggle with a cost of existence crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, that's very much what it is. It's cost of existence crisis. I mean, like, because, the, the, yeah. When it, when it comes to like refugees from from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, like any of these places in which like our military has been either directly or indirectly involved in destabilizing the country, like my my feeling is always like we have cost that nation so many billions, like and we've cost them lives, like countless lives, in which you can't put a price, and and yeah, the stability of of. Yeah, the, their lives in in a lot of cases were were either Britain or Britain's allies have have been the cause of of yeah the destruction in that area. Like if you, yeah, you look at the way the, the way we've done shit in the Middle East over the past thirty years. Like my my problem is always like I almost feel like we owe like a lot of these people to like, if we've destroyed their home and they've come fleeing war and the bombs that we're literally fucking dropping. I'm well, like, yeah, I you mean, know, it, that's 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 where it gets really difficult for me because, like, because I totally understand like the, the the case you're making, right? And I do vaguely agree that like we should definitely try and sort out our problems at home because the people like because I don't feel like immigrants and and refugees or, or or migrants to the country should be treated better than the people who live here that that seems stupid and like against like every idea of equality and like equal access to to, to things that's meant to be the values that we stand <laughs> for right no but like if someone wants to come to the country and they're fleeing war and they've got some they, they rock up with their family and they've you know they've had to come across them on those fucking dinghies maybe across the med and then to britain through the, through the channel like, I can't imagine how horrifying that must be, right? And if they rock up and they've got some, like, dental problem and they're, like, given a legit asylum, like, request, it's, like, fair enough. But like you said, like, why is that not, like, open to everybody? And well, absolutely. And, and, and look, I, I have a fundamental full agreement that the modern movement of mass migration that's caused from the Middle Eastern countries, uh, from certainly from our side of things, and if you also look in South America, where the United States has an absolutely enormous problem. Mm -hmm. The estimates of two and a half million, I've heard up to four million in the past year that have crossed the border into the United States, mm -hmm. is a direct consequence of the foreign policy of Western nations who are seeking to expand uh, corporatization in what we call the Western's ideals. Mm -hmm. No different in, in, in my way, of thinking than what the Victorians uh, were doing when we, we were sending out our boats and ships across Asia and Africa to colonize those countries. We want every country to have a McDonald's in and a Starbucks. We want all their internet services to be run by US companies. We want all their technology to be run by Apple and uh, Meta and Facebook and all the other technological companies. And that way we have a constant stream of income from all the African countries we've taken over, the Middle Eastern countries. We want to be able to manage the oil and gas that's predominantly coming from our shale or gas or off coast from the United States. Uh, and so that is the, the, the house. I, I mean, I think everyone must have known Game of Thrones. Yeah. What we're living in is a corporate Game of Thrones, backed by governments in modern day terminology. And if we look at the way that you've got the Ukraine, for example, and I know we don't want to talk about it in, enormously, I mean, I have read the reports. I've seen the, uh, the, the speeches by George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. way before 2014 saying that it was not necessary to have a Ukraine that was a member of NATO. After all, you had Finland and Sweden. But there were those who were in the Clinton um, cabinet as the ex-head of the CIA said, when he said, let's not force NATO into the Ukraine. Well, Al Gore and his mob said, we must do so. So why is Al Gore pushing an agenda to put more militarization and supporting increasing tension onto the borders of Russia? 
It's because it's part of the great game, the new modern Game of Thrones. Because if we can pressurize Ukraine, we can reduce the oil and gas that's coming into uh, Europe from Russia. That means that we can expand our own oil and gas and LPG into Europe, thus profiting in our businesses. We bog down Russia that's growing as a country. It's it's dealing with its um, poverty levels whilst we destabilize it and maybe put our friendly people in it. Of course, we can't invade Russia just as we did Iran and Iraq and put our people in there. So let's do it a different way. And then, of course, we got the threat from China. So we've got to stop them being friends and then put pressure on China. And you're going to see this over Taiwan now. I think we're going to see a buildup that China wants to invade Taiwan. That we Is it this week, 32,000 uh, naval officers from across countries across the globe are in the, the great Pacific uh, um, training process of, of California, all expanding a potential war in, with, uh, with China in that, in that region. So they do that every year. I mean, it's, I think it's every couple of years. There wasn't any done during COVID. So this military complex is about expansion of corporate businesses. And people suffer. And the people who suffer, if you take the example of I- 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 Afghanistan, and I think that's very clear because I've done quite a bit of research on it. Uh, recently. Afghanistan has a a rather large population, twice the size of Syria. And it had literally 98% poverty class, working class people, people who are existing. Millions were living in camps in Iran and millions were living in camps in, uh, in Pakistan. We then have a war. And in that war, we have put in trillions of dollars into that country. We've taken out the ones that we think are our best friends. We've educated them in Oxford University and their children. We've brought them over to Harvard and Yale to create a political class. Their military officers were brought over to Sandhurst and over into the United States to create a military class that were in our ideals. We then allowed non-governmental organizations and civil services to build jobs, of which suddenly there was a middle class of nearly 5 to 10%. Those people are now had shopping malls to go to. They could have coffee. They could go out for dinner. But there were still millions of people living out of this outside of Kabul in poverty in tents and shacks, whilst the elite were beginning to enjoy themselves very much, funded by Western money. The Taliban have come back in and said, hey ho, that's not right. And these people have gone, hang on a minute. Oh, my daughter's being educated here. All the things that we expect and are right and they should happen, but they're going, I can't live in this country now. I'm used to having a nice dress. I'm used to be able to go into the mall. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to sell the items that they have to go to the country that they blame as holding responsibility, and that's us. And what you find is the first wave of people that leave countries on mass migration are the richest in those countries. Oh, yeah. It's not the poor who live the camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can afford to leave. They can of pay, course. You know, they can pay for the flight before, you know, they can they can get out before things collapse. And it's costing 12,000 to 15,000 pounds to move from Afghanistan to the UK via the three trips from Afghanistan through to Turkey, Turkey to France, France to us. Now, they can either afford it directly If there's more than them, they do loans with a loan scheme Mm. with the the criminals. And then they have to pay them back over a period of time. So we're aiding and abetting mass criminality that's used to fund people trafficking, child abuse, drug abuse. So every time we accept these people coming in from the channel boats, we are aiding and abetting someone's death somewhere along the world because we've not got the process properly done. And we're enabling the rich to leave their countries who we created to come here to live and they get here and they're not as happy because they don't have the big houses. What is it? The uh, Some of the home office said that the average is six to eight people as a family of an Afghan and they don't have houses for six to eight. We don't build them. So they hate being cramped. Mm. So we have to find big houses for them. So this is the circular economy from war to immigration that I've always opposed. We should be helping out countries improve their lives, but we shouldn't be invading them because this is the consequence. It's why I was opposed to the Ukraine war, because that's going to go on for a long, long time. The consequences are going to be spread across the globe, all because 
some people believed in the US predominantly and also here in the UK that it was right that Ukraine should be a member of NATO to put pressure on Russia. Yeah. Why not just allow them to live their country and grow and give security concerns to Russia and say, we'll, we'll be just like Sweden and Finland? I don't think they'd have done anything about that. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe they would have invaded anyway. But we now have a crisis in Poland, in Estonia, in the UK, in Italy, and globally on food prices, which is damaging, making people starve in Africa for the greed of the few corporates that will benefit from this. And, and that's why I, 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 I call it left wing, call it morality. I just call it anti greed and anti those who are selfish. And that's why I do what I try to do. Well, I hope, <laughs> I hope that people have made it to the end here and, and understood. <laughs> like, no, because I mean, because it's very, very easy for people. Like, once you start, once we start talking about immigration, for people to be like, oh, well, it's just, this is just racist. And like write oh, of it course. off, and yeah. like yeah, I'm I'm sure you've had that plenty. Oh but yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Like to listen to 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 listen to the reasons for which you oppose a lot of these things is, you know, I think people could benefit from from hearing that because even I hadn't considered that the this aspect of funding people trafficking mm. when we're when we're allowing the channel boats like and and that's a very difficult thing to stop because like there's always going to be like people trying trying to do that basically i mean yeah. it's until until our, until our asylum post is at the channel and and that's <laughs> i mean yeah that's a whole other kettle of fish but like as long yeah, as i haven't exist, watched the uh, hollywood movie that creates that yet with a gap in the sea that just sinks them down <laughs> Into a, into a submarine below that takes them away to Rwanda. I, I'm sure people would want that, but... <laughs> I have no idea what the Rwanda thing was. Oh, about, but anyway. <laughs> another uh, day. Yeah, another day. But Stephen, <laughs> anyway, I, I have to run, but uh, I really want to really thank you for your time. Um, really, okay. really interesting chat, man. Um, thank you. I thank look you, forward to seeing the reaction. Okay, me too. All right, take uh, care. You too, man. Thank Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.